The subject today is a thing called financial education, which is a very big subject. You can make a lot of money and still be poor. If you're poor, you know, what, what is financial education for you? If you're middle class, what's the best financial education for you? And then what is rich? The real key here is this, there's financial education for the poor, there's financial education for people who are middle class, and there's financial education for those who want to be rich. So today we're all, you know, Garrett and I are going to be saying something that some of you may, dis may disturb you because some of you are actually still poor people. You, you know, they, you can make a lot of money and still be poor. Right, it's, it's that person's choice and their yeah. freedom. Yeah. Believe in freedom as a core value. Yeah. yeah, you want to be poor, have a good time. You know, I've, I've been poor, I've been happy, and I've been middle class and I've been happy. And I've been rich, but I've been happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today you're going to find out once again, if you're poor, you know, what, what is financial education for you? If you're middle class, what's the best financial education for you? And then what is rich? And so the thing I really enjoyed about Garrett's story is this, is that as a young guy, uh, where were you growing up? Uh, Price, Utah, a small coal mining town with maybe 12,000 people in it. And uh, how old were you when you got the book, The Millionaire Next Door? I think, I think I was probably 16 years old when I got that book, and it was the first financial book I had read. And uh, so that's what I thought there was. That's how I thought you did it at first. Right. And just for your information, The Millionaire Next Door was written by, I think, a PhD or something. And yep. Stanley is his name. Exactly. And uh, it came out in 96. And I read the book, and a lot of people loved it. Do you know what I mean? And that's our conversation today. For a lot of people, Millionaire Next Door is a great book. But when I read it, I went, I'd never do this stuff. Well, yeah. unfortunately, I followed it at first and kind of cut back. And yeah. I, it, no one shrinks their way rich, but that book's about how to shriek, right? That's right. How to cut out. Yeah. So for the middle class, if you like being middle class and you don't really like risk and all that stuff and you love paying taxes, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. So I'm not, again, I want you to hear that we're not trying to make fun of anything or any of the viewers or listeners. It's really important you know who you are. Like, the, like I said, I've been poor and I was quite happy being poor. And I've been middle class and I've been rich. But for me to change, I had to change whose advice I listened to. Isn't that true? Yep. So, um, so you're at M Millionaire Next Door. What, what, how did you respond to it? I mean, well, I, I became uh, basically a cheapskate. I, I was on my path to being a broke millionaire. I, I, I counted every dollar. I was so attuned with budgeting, but I wasn't thinking about value creation and production. I kind of adopted a scarcity mindset, right. which was all about, you know, what could I save? What could I uh, cut back on? What could I eliminate? I went on a trip with my wife to San Diego. And the whole time I was there, I thought about how much how everything how much everything cost, and that I wasn't in my business, which at the time was more like self-employed with the cash flow quadrant than it was a business. So I wasn't making money when I was away. So I'm thinking about all those dollars, consuming my mind, consuming my time. And my wife is like, "We're spending less money on food, and we're on our vacation. This doesn't feel like a vacation. It feels like a prison." So that's how I I, I mean I took it yeah. pretty seriously when I read that book. And when I read the book, you know, I think you talked about. I don't know, it's been, old, it's been 96, and my book came out in 97, I go, oh, geez. So in 96, I read about it, you know, and, you know, today I don't drive one Ferrari, I drive two Ferraris. Now, would Mr. Stanley recommend driving Ferraris? Absolutely not, no. right. And let me tell you something, I feel better in a Ferrari, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a wonderful car, but so is a Toyota. So for most people, they should drive a Toyota Prius, right? According to that book, absolutely. Yeah. Now, if it makes you happy, <laughs> But only if you paid cash for that car. Yes, yes. I hate to say yes. <laughs> but anyway, I have a friend who absolutely loves her Toyota Prius. You know? And I may be Japanese, but I don't look good in Toyotas. You know? I look better in Ferraris. So uh, <laughs> this is what we're getting at here. You see, it's your values. Yep. Right? Values. So when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, now you're struggling with Stanley's book about the millionaire next door. And what there, how you became a millionaire was interested. It was very easy in 1996 to become a millionaire just because the economy went like this in America. Right. So you bought a house, let's say, when you're 25, 
for let's say eighty thousand dollars and by you know some years later the house is now worth a million dollars right and that's how you became rich you were you were getting rich by being frugal and riding the u.s economy up investing in the stock market it went up but the problem is today it's not going this way it's going this way absolutely right so absolutely. that's why the millionaire next door is still a good book but you may be going this you way. might ride that wave all the way yeah. down and crash so that's the point I, I want to be very clear I'm not making fun of dr. Stanley or anybody else who mentioned today the point is what's inside of you you know are you happy with a Toyota Prius knock yourself out I'm not okay if you understand that point of it like I've always had nice cars because I like nice cars yeah I love nice cars I know we've had some of the same cars yeah. in our past yeah and my first car was like 1969 Corvette and I graduated from college in 1969 you know so I was really happy and I did other things to pay for the car now some other people tell you the Prius is that correct yes and for some people the bus is fine right yeah I know, I know people who are very happy because they take a bus right or ride a bike or ride a bike yes. yeah and it just depends on you so that's our story today so please don't get upset if you think I'm making fun of people so then you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that clicked. That resonated. That and your made spirit. Sense. Yeah, and before I thought it was all about what I could cut back and set aside for 30 right. years, and all of a sudden I was like, wait, cash flow. That could be something Asset immediate. Creation. That's, you know, create assets to produce cash flow. Yeah. And, and that changed the trajectory of my career, of my focus, of right. my life. And that's the reason I like this book here, is Killing Sacred Cows. It's what's really killing a lot of people financially is they have a sacred cow. Right. Like, you know, the old sacred cows that worked for my generation are you go to school, but you learn nothing about money. Right. You get a job, and today kids are going to school and they're finding no jobs, but they're deeply in debt. Okay. You save money. <laughs> And why would you save money when the Fed is printing trillions of dollars? Exactly. And you buy a house because your house is an asset. And in 2007, the housing prices plunged. They got wiped out. And I think the worst thing of all, between what we agree on, is invest for the long term in a 401k full of mutual funds, right? Right. And so the first thing are, I attacked in my book was that. Yeah. And so those are sacred cows. Why would you save money when the Fed has admitted to printing four trillion dollars? Because they can print it faster than you can save it, right? Right. And then this thing about get out of debt. I mean, debt is money, you know, but it's good advice for the poor and middle class and all this stuff. So these are some of the sacred cows. So what happened to you when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Well, the first thing I did is I went and bought the cash flow game. Right. Because it talked about that. And then I invited my friends over. And we, it was actually a Friday night. We got all of them together. And we started and playing the game. How old were you? Yeah, at that time I was 18, probably. I mean, we're in college. We're, we had people over at our house all the time. So I invited everybody over. We, we played the game together. And it, it really started to separate out Your friends. like friends and philosophy, right? Which was hard at the time, but helpful long run. Right. Right. So some of the people that I played that game with way back then, I work with now. I partnered on deals with right. others. It gave me the insight that you would never want to do business with them. Right. And again, I want to reiterate this. There's poor, middle class, and rich. And ri the cash flow game teaches people to be rich. And there's other people who don't want to be rich. They just want to be middle class, which is their choice. It matches their spirit. So here we are in 2015. This is what we're saying, guys. There's poor, middle class, and rich, and there's advice for poor people. A lot of people like being poor. Yep. And you want to be middle class, that's great advice for you. And you want to be rich, that's great advice for them. So what if I came to you, he's 2015, and I said, Mr. Gunderson, I'm a financial planner. You know, I sell life insurance primarily. But, you know, the stock market goes on up on average 7%. So that's why you should invest for the long term. What would you say to me? This is 2015. <laughs> I'll say, whatever happened in the past has no chance of happening in the near term, and I'm worried about that thing going down a lot in the near term. And what if I said to you, I said, look, but, you know, there's dollar cost averaging, and, you know, it's over the long term. And, you know, you'll be, you'll be a millionaire in 40 years. What would you say to that? Well, I actually did a little research, and from 2000 until this year, adjusted for inflation, the stock market did 8 8.4% total, not per year. Oh. Total 
How many years? Adjusted for that? inflation. That's almost 15 years. But you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm a financial planner. <laughs> now let me ask you this: How much training did you have as a financial planner? I had I had a few years training. It was uh, not that much though. All my training. Now, how, uh, how long does it take to get a license? Uh, about a week at most. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I took a test while I was in college, and they got. They Did gave you know me, anything about markets? No. But you're, you were selling. For, you were selling. For, I got my Series Six and Sixty Three license. It took you a week. It took me a week. I took a. I bought a so, book. I scheduled the test, and I got like a ninety-three percent on that test. So what you see, financial planners do. Coming out, the moment you get licensed, do you know much? No, not at all. Are you qualified to advise somebody how to put their future, on, you know, provide for the future? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, it's all about cliches like you're in it for the long haul, or in almost all your trainings on how to build trust, how to build selling, a relationship. Right? It's all selling. I mean, yeah. you, you barely learn about the product. You have no idea, right? Right. You just have these charts. And they always love to show the charts when the market's up. They don't quite publish them during the downturns right. as often, right? Right. And this is the, the other part about it. How long does it take to become a licensed massage therapist? I don't know, but probably a lot longer than it takes to it's be about a... about six months. I mean, dentists, it takes how many years? years? I mean, you know, surgeons, we're talking eight extra years of school afterwards. Yet, I mean, I could, you, you can give me whatever financial test needs to happen. I'll, I'll tell you this. When I wrote Killing Sacred Cows, my legal team said, you know what, you're pretty bold with a few of these things. You're calling out 401ks, you're calling yeah. out financial institutions. Well, so do I. Yeah. We're worried, yeah. yeah. They're like, we're worried about lawsuits, and so one of the things we think you should do is go get your registered investment advisory and set up a firm and pass the test. So it's a Series 65. And I had forgotten that I signed up for the test. And on Sunday, I realized when I looked at my calendar for Monday, I had that test Monday morning. So I'm like, well, I better study a little bit. But there was a great basketball game on, and I got really caught up in the basketball game because LeBron James was just going crazy. And I took the test the next morning and got an 88% with less than one hour study. And that was one of the higher degrees the Series 65 was. So let's say you know, it's really easy to pass the test, but do you know anything about actually planning for somebody's future? I learned more taking this Steve Harrop, my professor, to lunch in one hour that I had learned in one year of financial training. So you're selling stuff you don't even know what you're selling. I've never met the fund manager, as a matter of fact. I don't even know what stocks are being held other than the top 10 stocks. I've never been inside the boardroom of a single one of those companies. So I learned how much I didn't know because I went to get an analyst position at a fund. And when they started interviewing me and asking me about intrinsic value and alpha and beta and all this, I was like, I don't know, because I was a salesperson at that point. It right. was like this awakening and this reality right in my face. So would you say financial planners, are they experts? Uh, at, at selling. They're sell salesmen. No, but at planning your future. Absolutely not. There's okay. no financial planning. It's a selling of a product for retirement. Right. So there I just want to say this, okay? A financial plan is great. You learn a lot of things in it, how to budget, and you don't know about wills and trust and insurance. There's things that are very value in it. But they're selling you something. That's the whole point here. So if you want to be poor, it's a great plan. And the thing that I always cringe at, because it happened to me when I went to work for the Xerox Corporation, I go into my HR, human resource person, they sit me down and they say, now choose which mutual fund you want in your plan. I, I don't know one mutual fund from the other. Did you know the difference? <laughs> no, they're just good marketing on which one was named better, right? Right. So they show you the four-star, Morningstar, and all yep. that stuff.